operating his automobile at the time and place in question, the defendant, James Cunningham, was bound by law to operate his automobile in a reasonably careful and prudent manner and was required to exercise ordinary care in the use of his senses of sight and hearing and also to keep a reasonable lookout for other persons lawfully using the street involved. He was also required to use ordinary care to keep his vehicle under such control that, to avoid a collision, he could stop as quickly as might be required of him by eventualities that would be anticipated by an ordinarily prudent driver in a similar position and in like circumstances. Negligence is not based upon the mere possibility of avoiding an accident. The defendant may not be held liable for negligence merely because he might have avoided the accident had he acted differently. If the defendant did all that an ordinarily prudent person would have done under the same or similar circumstances to avoid the accident in question, the defendant is not chargeable with negligence and may not be held liable in this case. Try that one again. Ladies and gentlemen, as I have heretofore instructed you, the burden is upon the plaintiff to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant was negligent. She must also prove that such negligence was a proximate cause of the injuries alleged to have been sustained by plaintiff. The proximate cause of an injury is that cause which, in natural and continuous sequence, unbroken by any efficient intervening cause produces the injury and without which the result would not have occurred. It is the efficient cause, the one that necessarily sets in operation the factors that accomplish or bring about the injury. While operating his automobile at the time and place in question, the defendant, James Cunningham, was bound by law to operate his automobile in a reasonably careful and prudent manner and was required to exercise ordinary care in the use of his senses of sight and hearing and also to keep a reasonable lookout for other persons lawfully using the street involved. He was also required to use ordinary care to keep his vehicle under such control that to avoid a collision, he could stop as quickly as might be required of him by eventualities that would be anticipated by an ordinarily prudent driver in a similar position and in like circumstances. Negligence is not based upon the possibility of avoiding an accident. The defendant may not be held liable for negligence merely because he might have avoided the accident had he acted differently. If the defendant did all that an ordinarily prudent person would have done under the same or similar circumstances to avoid the accident in question, the defendant is not chargeable with negligence and may not be held liable in this case. Let's try that one one more time. You guys using the brief for prudent person? Mm -hmm. What is it? P-R-U-P. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's try that one one more time. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, as I have heretofore instructed you, the burden is upon the plaintiff to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant was negligent. She must also prove that such negligence was a proximate cause of the injuries alleged to have been sustained by plaintiffs. The proximate cause of an injury is that cause which, in natural and continuous sequence, unbroken by any efficient intervening cause, produces the injury and without which the result would not have occurred. It is the efficient cause, the one that necessarily sets in operation the factors that accomplish or bring about the injury. 
and while operating his automobile at the time and place in question. The defendant, James Cunningham, was bound by law to operate his automobile in a reasonably careful and prudent manner and was required to exercise ordinary care in the use of his senses of sight and hearing and also to keep a reasonable lookout for other persons lawfully using the street involved. He was also required to use ordinary care to keep his vehicle under such control that to avoid a collision he could stop as quickly as might be required of him by eventualities that would be anticipated by an ordinarily prudent driver in a similar position and in like circumstances. Negligence is not based upon the possibility of avoiding an accident. The defendant may not be held liable for negligence merely because he might have avoided the accident had he acted differently. If the defendant did all that an ordinarily prudent person would have done under the same or similar circumstances to avoid the accident in question, the defendant is not chargeable with negligence and may not be held liable in this case. All right, let's try another one. No person shall drive a vehicle upon a highway at a speed greater than is reasonable or prudent having due regard for the traffic on and the surface and width of the highway and in no event at a speed which endangers the safety of persons or property. That section of the vehicle code must be considered in the light of the principle of law that applies in the case of violations of a statute or code which have been proved. That principle may be stated as follows. The violation of a provision of the State Vehicle Code is presumptively an act of negligence and is conclusive proof of negligence unless and until it is shown by the party charged with such violation to have been excusable or justifiable in the circumstances of the case. To be justifiable or excusable, it must also appear that the act of the defendant in violating the code, if you find that he did so violate it, was such as might reasonably have been expected of a person of ordinary prudence in the same or similar circumstances. The fact or condition which will excuse the violation of the vehicle code must be one resulting from a cause beyond the control of the person guilty of such violation. In this connection, you may assume that a person of ordinary prudence will make reasonable efforts to obey the law and will do so unless causes not of his own intentional making induce him to do otherwise. Moreover, unless such violation, even though unexcused by proof of circumstances, was a proximate cause of the injury complained of, it becomes immaterial. There must in all cases appear to be a causal connection between the violation of the law and the injury complained of before such violation may be considered by you as proving negligence. The rate of speed at which an automobile travels upon a highway, considered as an isolated fact and simply in terms of so many miles an hour, is not proof either of negligence or of the exercise of ordinary care. Let's try that one again. No person shall drive a vehicle upon a highway at a speed greater than is reasonable or prudent having due regard for the traffic on and the surface and width of the highway and in no event at a speed which endangers the safety of persons or property. That section of the vehicle code must be considered in the light of the principle of law that applies in the case of violations of a statute or code which have been proved. 
that principle may be stated as follows. The violation of a provision of the state vehicle code is presumptively an act of negligence and is conclusive proof of negligence unless and until it is shown by the party charged with such violation to have been excusable or justifiable in the circumstances of the case. To be justifiable or excusable, it must also appear that the act of the defendant in violating the code, if you find that he did so violate it, was such as might reasonably have been expected of a person of ordinary prudence in the same or similar circumstances. The fact or condition which will excuse the violation of the vehicle code must be one resulting from the cause beyond the control of the person guilty of such violation. In this connection, you may assume that a person of ordinary prudence will make reasonable efforts to obey the law and will do so unless causes not of his own intentional making induce him to do otherwise. Moreover, unless such violation, even though unexcused by proof of circumstances, was a proximate cause of the injury complained of, it becomes immaterial. There must in all cases appear to be a causal connection between the violation of the law and the injury complained of before such violation may be considered by you as proving negligence. The rate of speed at which an automobile travels upon a highway considered as an isolated fact and simply in terms of so many miles an hour is not proof either of negligence or of the exercise of ordinary care. Try another one. One more time. No person shall drive a vehicle upon a highway at a speed greater than is reasonable or prudent, having due regard for the traffic on and the surface and width of the highway and in no event at a speed which endangers the safety of persons or property. That section of the vehicle code must be considered in the light of the principle of law that applies in the case of violations of a statute or code which have been proved. That principle may be stated as follows. The violation of a provision of the state vehicle code is presumptively an act of negligence and is conclusive proof of negligence unless and until it is shown by the party charged with such violation to have been excusable or justifiable in the circumstances of the case. To be justifiable or excusable, it must also appear that the act of the defendant in violating the code, if you find that he did so violate it, was such as might reasonably have been expected of a person of ordinary prudence in the same or similar circumstances. But the fact or condition which will excuse the violation of the vehicle code must be one resulting from the cause beyond the control of the person guilty of such violation. In this connection, you may assume that a person of ordinary prudence will make reasonable efforts to obey the law and will do so unless causes not of his own intentional making induce him to do otherwise. Moreover, unless such violation, even though unexcused by proof of circumstances, was a proximate cause of the injury complained of if it becomes immaterial. But there must in all cases appear to be a causal connection between the violation of the law and the injury complained of before such violation may be considered by you as proving negligence. Now, the rate of speed at which an automobile travels upon a highway considered as an isolated fact and simply in terms of so many miles an hour is not proof either of negligence or of the exercise of ordinary care. Whether that rate of speed is a negligent one is a question of fact, the answer to which depends on all the surrounding circumstances. A person who himself is exercising ordinary care has a right to assume that others too will perform their duty under the law and he has a further right to rely and act on that assumption. 
And thus it is not negligence for a person to fail to anticipate injury which can come to him only from a violation of the law or duty by another. However, an exception should be noted that the right just defined does not exist when it is reasonably apparent to one or in the exercise of ordinary care would be apparent to him that another is not going to perform his duty. What is not justified in ignoring obvious danger, although it is created by another's misconduct, nor is he ever excused from exercising ordinary care. A person who, without negligence on his part, is suddenly confronted with unexpected and imminent danger, either to himself or to others, is not expected nor required to use the same judgment and prudence that is required of him in the exercise of ordinary care in calmer and more deliberate moments. His duty is to exercise only the care that an ordinarily prudent person would exercise if confronted under the same circumstances with the same unexpected danger. Starts with the court. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God, I do. Please take the stand, please state your full name, and spell your last name for the record. Wade, W-A-D-E, Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. -L. Mr. Phillips? Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, what is your profession? I am a physician specializing in psychiatry. Are you duly licensed to practice your profession in the state of Mississippi? Yes, I am. Doctor, since an expert must be shown to be qualified before he is allowed to express an opinion in court, I would like to ask you certain questions about your background and education and experience. You understand that is necessary, do you not? Yes. You have no objection to my asking you those questions? No. Uh, thank you, doctor. Doctor, how many years have you been licensed to practice medicine? Since 1977. And would you tell the jury, if you would, a little bit about your college and medical education? Yes, I received my <coughs> BA degree from Notre Dame University and my MD degree from University <coughs> of Michigan. Following graduation from medical school, I did an internship in medicine at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles and returned to New York to do a residency in psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Following that, I served as a psychiatrist with the United States Navy for two years and then came back to New York where I took an advanced fellowship in psychiatry and law at Columbia University. When I completed that program, I remained on at the CU faculty first as an instructor and then as an assistant professor of psychiatry. I am a clinical professor of psychiatry and I teach at the University of Mississippi. Let me back up just a little bit. Would you describe for the jury, if you would, what your internship consisted of? The internship was 12 months of general medicine. It was not psychiatry. It involved taking care of patients, emergency room work, ward work, specific elective work in cardiology, and in the cardiac care unit. At that time, I had an interest in cardiology and spent four months out of the 12 months doing cardiology and the rest in general medicine. I take it then you decided to go into the field of psychiatry? Yes. You then entered a residency and were accepted for a residency? Correct. Describe for the jury, if you would, a little bit about what a psychiatric residency consists of, what training you received, what your duties are, and 
how long that residency takes. The residency in psychiatry is three years. The first year of the residency is basically inpatient work in an emergency room and you work on the wards. I work in a city hospital where there was a very large population and a large variety of psychiatric illness taking care of the most desperately ill people who are inpatients at both Upstate Hospital and the Metropolitan State Hospital in New York. The second year consists of outpatient work at a clinic doing therapy with patients with supervision. During all of this time, of course, you are taking courses and reading extensively in the literature of psychiatry. You have tutorial classes and lectures. It is both a practical experience on the wards and a didactic experience in the classroom. The third year is an extension of both those experiences, both inpatient and outpatient work with specific electives and something that interests you. I spent part of my third year doing what is called consultation and liaison psychiatry, where I went around to medical patients who were in medical wards. I concentrated on psychiatric problems and medical patients. You mentioned the word didactic in a classroom, having a lecture as opposed to the practical experience, bedside experience. All right, I see. And then following this three-year residency, you went into private practice, did you? No, I went into the Navy as a psychiatrist for two years. And would you describe your duties during your two-year tour of duty in the service, if you will? I spent 15 months at Mercy General Hospital which was a large receiving hospital in the East. My duties consisted of running an inpatient psychiatric program, a large ward, and supervising all the medics and enlisted personnel who were working in the units. Okay, same one. Starts with the court, going into direct by plaintiff. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God, I do. Please take the stand, please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Wade, W-A-D-E, Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. -L. Mr. Phillips, thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, what is your profession? I am a physician specializing in psychiatry. Are you duly licensed to practice your profession in the state of Mississippi? Yes, I am. Doctor, since an expert must be shown to be qualified before he is allowed to express an opinion in court, I would like to ask you certain questions about your background and education and experience. You understand that is necessary, do you not? Yes. You have no objection to my asking you those questions? No. Thank you, doctor. How many years have you been licensed to practice medicine? Since 1977. And would you tell the jury, if you would, a little bit about your college and medical education? Yes. I received my BA degree from Notre Dame University and my MD degree from University of Michigan. Following graduation from medical school, I did an internship in medicine at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles and returned to New York to do a residency in psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Following that, I served as a psychiatrist with the United States Navy for two years and then came back to New York where I took an advanced fellowship in psychiatry and law at Columbia University. When I completed that program, I remained on at the CU faculty, first as an instructor, and then as an assistant professor of psychiatry. I am a clinical professor of psychiatry, and I teach at the University of Mississippi. Let me back up just a little bit. Would you describe for the jury, if you would, 
but your internship consisted of the internship was 12 months of general medicine. It was not psychiatry. It involved taking care of patients, emergency room work, ward work, specific elective work in cardiology and in the cardiac care unit. At that time, I had an interest in cardiology and spent four months out of the 12 months during doing cardiology and the rest in general medicine. I take it then you decided to go into the field of psychiatry? Yes. And then you entered a residency and were accepted for a residency? Correct. Describe for the jury, if you would, a little bit about what a psychiatric residency consists of, what training you receive, what your duties are, and how long that residency takes. The residency in psychiatry is three years. The first year of the residency is basically inpatient work in an emergency room, and you work on the wards. I worked in a city hospital where there was a large population and a large variety of psychiatric illness, taking care of the most desperately ill people who are inpatients at both Upstate Hospital and the Metropolitan State Hospital in New York. The second year consists of outpatient work at a clinic doing therapy with patients with supervision. During all of this time, of course, you are taking courses and reading extensively in the literature of psychiatry. You have tutorial classes and lectures. It is both a practical experience on the wards and a didactic experience in the classroom. The third year is an extension of both those experiences both inpatient and outpatient work with specific electives and something that interests you. I spent part of my third year doing what is called consultation and liaison psychiatry where I went around to medical patients who were in medical wards. I concentrated on psychiatric problems in medical patients. You just mentioned the word didactic. Could you tell me what that is? That just means sitting in a classroom having a lecture as opposed to the practical experience, bedside experience. All right, I see. And then following this three-year residency, you went into private practice, did you? No. <clears throat> I went into the Navy as a psychiatrist for two years. And would you describe your duties during this two-year tour in the service, if you will? I spent 15 months at Mercy General Hospital, which was a large receiving hospital in the East. My duties consisted of running an inpatient psychiatric program, a large ward, and supervising all the medics and enlisted personnel who were working in the units. 